Have you ever felt the urge to speak your mind but couldn't quite muster the courage to go through with it? Well, you're not alone. In this episode of Moments of Truth, I had the delight to sit down with James Diedert, who's the John L. Colley Professor of Business Administration at the Darden School of Business at the University of Virginia. And he's the author of Choosing Courage, The Everyday Guide to Being Brave at Work. James's work on how to be competent when speaking truth to power is groundbreaking. Take a listen. So, um, Jim, w- one of the things I have so appreciated about your work on courage um, is how practical you made it. You, you've distilled a, a difficult concept into things people can do every day. And so when I think about one of the places organizations struggle with their integrity, and, and, uh, they struggle with being who they say they are, is they, everybody puts up a mission statement, vision statement, brand promises. But then when the actions don't match the words, you create this sense of system-wide duplicity, where in my head, I'm thinking, okay, we say one thing, we do another. I have to believe that for the everyday person in an employee, that's not going to encourage courage. It's gonna, it, it may. So talk about how does, when, when you see a mismatch between action and words, what is it, what is it, like, does that have on, cur- on people's courage? Uh, I think you're right about your supposition that it's not going to encourage courage. Mm-hmm. If you think about, you know, all of us in hierarchical organizations, look upward, it's probably a feature of just being the human species. We look upward for, uh, for models, for, for signals of what's expected and appropriate and what's not expected or, or inappropriate. And when you see that kind of duplicity, the message uh, you clearly take, despite what your ears are hearing is, you know, do what I do, not what I say. And uh, I think, yeah, I've been in inspired by Patrick Lencioni's talk about the difference between core and espoused or aspirational values and how many organizations have sort of a beautiful list of what they would claim are their core values. But but in fact, they're just aspirational values. They're just things that everybody says and because they'd be nice if they were true. Uh, But what I find powerful about his distinction is that if a value is truly a core value, you should be able to point to instances of pain. You should be able to point to instances where it costs you something to stand up for it. And I think employees are uh, smart people for the most part, and they can figure out the difference between uh, what we aspire to in our communication patterns and what, in fact, we're willing to suffer some pain for. And one form of pain that you learn quickly is are our own leaders secure enough and curious enough and, and um, you know, sure enough of, of themselves to actually hear difficult truths. Is that a kind of pain they endure? And I think people learn quite quickly. If the answer is no, then that's a model for what I'm going to do. So one of the other places we, 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 in our research, found that there are gaps in systems that encourage dishonesty were accountability and governance. You know, accountability seen, being seen as unfair. Um, governance being seen as not transparent. Um, so I want to flip the script here and sort of let you imagine if our governance systems were seen as more transparent, meaning I, the decisions you're making, I can see how you got there, whether I agree with them or not. If I felt like my contributions were looked at in a fair way, a just, just way, um, I, would, I would contribute differently. How would you imagine those things being true Encourage, encourage. How would what would enable accountability and governance to unleash more courage? So, if you go back uh, well beyond my own research on on speaking up or voice, which I'll come back to in a second, well before that, there was literature on justice, in particular, different kinds of justice in organizations. And one of the things that's pretty well established is that. Uh, there's a difference between procedural justice, right, the way things are done, and then distributive justice, sort of the actual justice of the outcomes, how, think, how the pie is divided up. And there's, um, there's pretty solid evidence that says people will accept distributive outcomes they don't find favorable for themselves as long as they believe the process was just, the way the decisions were made were fair. Uh, and that has long been said to include both people feeling they had input into the decision made uh, and that they were really heard in the way the decision was made. 
And in my own research, the way that has played out is one big factor behind why people don't speak up regularly is fear. They, they fear all sorts of consequences, negative career and, and social and other. But a second, often equally powerful uh, inhibitor is the belief that it's futile. It's just a waste of time. Uh, I can speak up, but you know my idea is in the trash can before I'm out the door. And so what I think, you know, if you had systems that were truly uh, accountable around, around sort of fair, honest, transparent procedures, you would eliminate a lot of the futility beliefs that also plague organizations. So it, it would help, sure, on the safety side, right, if you had more line of sight into what was happening and why and you felt good about it. But I think what it really would help on is this belief that it's worth my energy. You know, it costs me something, right, in just sheer energy to put together a proposal, to come schedule a meeting with you, to tell you what's wrong, to propose a solution. And if I don't think that any consideration is going to be given to that, I just stop doing it. And so I think, you know, you might not get more courage per se, because courage, I think, requires the perception of risk. But I certainly think you'd get more voice because people would feel something, you know, was going to be considered and done. Right. What have you seen people, even in the, in the hardest of conditions, where have you, what factors have you seen cultivate courage um, that a person, if I'm, if I'm looking to sort of have more of a voice or, or leave my mark in a different way, what, what are the things you've seen people do to, that, or what are the factors that influence whether or not they can? So I think first we should, you know, distinguish between uh, any kind of courageous action and then courageous action that you or I or others might view as uh, competent courage or sort of, you know, well-executed courage. Uh, I have tried to focus on the latter from the perspective that if every time somebody engages in a courageous workplace act, it's going to be seen as requiring some form of martyrdom, you know, be a career ending move, it's never going to happen very often. And, and moreover, that if our goal is often to create real change rather than just take a stand, then it's actually important that the people who witness, right, or are the targets of our courageous acts are, are willing and able to listen. Uh, and so, so I think you have to think about both, you know, what sort of might cultivate or predict just people in general speaking up or being courageous, uh, and then what might actually predict whether they do it competently. The, the sad truth is that we don't know a whole lot, uh, despite lots of effort for many decades, we don't know a whole lot about uh, what we might think of, you know, as dispositional or individual differences. If you go back to, you know, studies of, uh, you know, Holocaust rescuers, uh, Oliner and Oliner, you know, they studied intensively what differentiated those few thousand that did versus, you know, the many that didn't. Uh, uh, Milgram in his, you know, famous experiments on, you know, obedience to authority. Also, you know, he spent decades trying to figure out what differentiated the subjects that refused to administer the shocks versus the majority that went all the way. And the truth is that uh, across those efforts and many, many others, this effort to predict the courageous type, the courageous disposition has failed. Uh, there is no sort of, there does not appear to be some innate, magical, you know, birthright for courageous action. Uh, the closest people seem to have gotten is to say that those people who uh, behave courageously, not necessarily all the time, but, you know, engage in notable courageous acts, are often compelled by some deep sense of must do. Um, some sense of sort of what they value, who they are. Um, you know, people have written about William James wrote about, you know, this idea we all have multiple selves, but the courageous seem to be clear on what is that one most important self that I must defend, that I must stand for. Uh, and, and I think you know, my own sense is that often the courageous acts come from people who at least in given situations simply would say, I, I felt compelled. I felt that to defend my, my truest self, which is usually about protecting others or some you know, principle we would admire, I must act. I really think it just, it comes down more than anything else to practice. Uh, 
you know, competently courageous behavior, right? The ability to speak in a, a persuasive, powerful way without offending, the ability to uh, pull together others and or resources in a unique, uh, powerful way. Those are behavioral skills. Mm. And all behavioral skills rest on practice. They rest on development. So you yeah. broke down every um, competent courage into four steps. Uh, laying the groundwork, pick your battles, persuading in the moment, and following through. Um, could you talk us through them? Because I, I love people to get a sense for, because what I loved about them and when I read them, the first time especially, and I've gone back and studied your article several times since, they're so dual, like we can all do it. There's nothing inaccessible about what you found in the research. So talk us through what they are and how somebody might learn them. Sure, I can talk about that. And, and I'll connect that back to what you just said about honesty and this notion of practice. Because I think one of the challenges in the realm of courage, and it sounds like you found it to be true in honesty, uh, is that too often I think we allow ourselves off the hook by telling ourselves a story, which is actually a myth about there's just a unique set of people who, who were sort of born with the ability or the right skills. And in the realm of courage in particular, I think we make that false belief uh, further solidify I'd, by telling most stories about courageous actors or heroes uh, in the form of the Gandhis and Martin Luther Kings, and we point to these absolute heroes, and in doing so, we actually allow people to say, well, that's clearly not me. Why would we think that any virtue like courage or honesty uh, is required only from some of us some of the time? I don't think there's any philosophy there's no religious system. There really is no system of thought I'm aware of that says virtuous behavior is only on some of us some of the time. I, I think of this framework really as breaking down the thinking about competent, courageous action as the things you would do before a specific opportunity arises, mm. how you would behave during that kind of opportunity, and then actually what you would do after. How, how would you advise a leader to de-risk um, the truth to make them actually bring the courage to the table and use it? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think the, you know, before I, I speak to the specifics of, you know, how does a leader go about doing that? I also think the, the frame issue is really important. Um, even though I've spent, you know, a lot of time thinking and writing about courage, and I think it's it's critically important because the reality is, uh, as important as psychological safety is, we're just so far away from the average organization being safe from top to bottom that we still need this behavior. Yeah. Uh, but that said, when leaders say to me, uh, you know, I have a problem with courageous behavior and I need you to help me encourage more courage. I actually push back on that and say, is that really your goal? Because if your goal is to encourage courage, you are essentially telling people, um, you're right, it's not safe here, and I don't intend to make it safe. I just want you to stick your neck out more. Is that really the message you want to send? Uh, my, my strong advice to you, Mr. and Mrs. CEO, is uh, your job is to change the conditions in the organization so that people engage in these important behaviors because they no longer think it requires courage. That to me is your job as a leader. Uh, and okay, so it's actually kind of hard to push back against it when you frame it that way. So then they say, okay, so then what? My view on that is uh, that you, you would do all the things and it's probably not worth us talking about the, so much the issues around uh, what you would do to create a climate of psychological safety, to create more trust interpersonally. You know, I think those are, in a sense, the more well-known. Uh, many other people, including yourself, have talked about those. What I would add is that there are structural and symbolic things you have to do as more senior people. So symbolically, uh, you, have to, uh, you have to model what it is you want from people. Uh, don't ask your own people to be vulnerable if you're never vulnerable in any obvious way. Don't ask your own people to stick their neck out if they never see you. 
Um, don't ask people to speak truth to power if they look at your senior team and conclude that every person on your senior team is a yes man or woman. Um, it's clear then what you actually value versus what you've said you value. Make sure that your systems for promotion include, um, you know, this person challenges me on a regular basis. This person gets me regularly to think and adopt new ideas. You know, so change your promotion system, your evaluation system. Uh, make it impossible for yes men and women to get up. Innovators and entrepreneurs deserve the upside of their courageous action. Then that should be true for anybody at any level. Absolutely. Absolutely. Amen. Jim, thank you so much. Um, such a great conversation. I knew that it would be fraught with insight and it was better than I thought. So thank you. Are you waiting for others to invite your opinion into the conversation? If so, you will luckily learn some incredible tips, tricks, and guidance from Khalil Smith's guest on this episode of Voices. Mary Slaughter is a managing director of People Advisory Services at Ernst & Young and a true expert in her field. Make sure you've got something nearby to take notes on. Enjoy. Well, thank you for sharing a bit of your time with me today. I know you've got a lot going on, Mary, but um, I would love for you maybe just to kind of introduce yourself a little bit for those folks that do not have the fortune of knowing you as well as I do. Um, and then, you know, the first question right out of the gate is how do you think about kind of speaking up and voice? Like, how do you define it for yourself? Yeah. So thanks for inviting me to be with you. It's always fun to spend time with you, Khalil. So for those who haven't met me, I'm Mary Slaughter. I'm based in Atlanta, Georgia, here in the U.S. And um, my role currently is I work at EY, Ernst & Young, and I'm a managing director in our people advisory services. And one of the areas of specialization I spend time in these days a lot is our diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging uh, work, but a lot in culture, a lot in leadership, a lot in organizational purpose. So things that are very near and dear to both of us. Yeah. Um, so speaking up, how do I think of it? So um, I was reflecting on this last night, and the first thing that came to mind for me, which I'll share with you, is there's sort of a visceral reaction that I have that turns, that signals me that it's a moment, mm. right, where you should be. So, you know, whether I say it's the hair on the back of your neck is standing up, or you're sort of in your mind, sort of multitasking, but a moment happens, somebody says something, something occurs, you've observed something, and it kind of brings you up short, and you kind of go, wait a minute, mm. you know, and, and what I would say is there's a lot of connection between your brain and your heart and your gut. Yeah. And, you know, when those signals hit you that says something doesn't feel right about that moment, you should listen. Mm. Uh, because you'll probably be disappointed in yourself if you, if you don't. And um, uh, the opportunity to give voice to something that probably lots of other people are thinking and wishing someone would uh, is an extraordinary moment for you as an individual and as a leader. I love that. I love that. I'm glad you didn't say the hair on your head stands up because I'd be like, I don't know what to do with that, Mary. <laughs> but I do have hair on the back of my neck. Um, but I'm curious. So, you know, for, for so many, and I know definitely earlier in my career, I suppress those moments, right? I felt like that was a nervousness that told me that actually maybe I should be quiet or maybe I right. was about to get myself in trouble or something. I'm curious how you, um, for yourself and, and how you've done it for others, because you've been a mentor for me in my career and have supported me and been my boss before. Um, and I know that you've encouraged people to speak up, but how do you get beyond that, oh, there's, there, I, I feel that thing in the pit of my stomach, or I feel my hair standing up, and that probably means I should be quiet and transition that into, no, actually now is an opportunity for me to find my voice or speak up or, or kind of, you know, uh, contribute something. Mm -hmm. Well, there are a lot of dimensions to it, so I'll just riff on them uh, for, for a little bit. So I, I, I think the first is that you should always start from a place of respect for 
the individuals with whom you're interacting. Mm. So even if you're in one of those moments where you feel like you need to speak up, you still have an obligation, not just to others, but to yourself to behave in a respectful way and to give voice to things in a way that doesn't assume the worst of someone else that perhaps assumes the best Mm. um, uh, of someone else and to even um, have the courage to be a little bit vulnerable about yourself. I mean, Brene Brown writes about this, you know, all the time about vulnerability, but to, to say, you know, to say out loud, to give voice to even your own concern about speaking up, it's like, you know, I, I'm hesitant to bring this up, but I'm also hesitant to let the moment go by and not, mm. you know, br- bring it up. So just sort of suggesting that even even you are feeling some uh, hesitancy, but that hesitancy is the very reason that you think it's important, um, yeah. you know, that that you bring it up. I love this quote from uh, Madeleine Albright, who was our um, first female Secretary of State for the United States. And she said that she finally figured this out and passed this advice along to her daughters and said, if you're waiting for someone to invite you into the conversation, you might be waiting a really long time. Mm. Uh, and what she said about herself was she would be in meetings, she'd be in situations where she heard dialogue going on and that all these ideas were coming to mind for her, some of which were where you were joining in an agreement and somewhere you might have thought radically different. And she kept waiting for someone to invite her opinion. And then she realized that's kind of not how it always works, that people get very focused on expressing themselves and don't think about the need necessarily to invite others in. So she had to challenge herself to get comfortable with respectfully finding a way to say, wait a minute, (laughs) before we leave that topic, I have some. I have something to say and something I need uh, yeah. to contribute, and I think it's just a remarkable piece of advice. That's awesome. And Mary, what what are some of the things that you do? Because you know, to your point, not everybody is inviting other people into the conversation, but there are the leaders that are really intentional about doing that. And there's always the balance mm-hmm. as well, right? You have some people with a preference for extroversion that maybe you need to modulate just a little bit. Some people with a yep. preference for introversion that are like, please don't put me on the spot. So what are some best practices that you found for welcoming in those points of view and not only encouraging people to speak up, but also creating an environment where you're actually kind of raising their voices. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, So I'm a big fan of cognitive dissonance, the idea that multiple competing ideas can come together and result in something better that some intersection of all of those ideas that not one idea necessarily wins out, but it's sort of the amalgamation of all those thoughts and the Mm -hmm. distillation that gets you to a better place. So um, I'll I'll tell you what I, one of the techniques I use, for example, if I were hiring people to work um, uh, with me or on my team, you know, I try a little bit of self-disclosure. You would probably uh, recognize this about me. Um, I would, you know, I'd say to folks, look, I almost always have an opinion. That does not mean I'm right. You know, and part of why you are here, part of why you are on this team and And part of this collaboration is that your opinion matters. And all of us cannot think of everything. And so the combination of those things and the interplay with one another causes us to bring forward, you know, the best of of the best. So please know I'll always have a point of view, but also know that I absolutely know that the vast majority of the time that idea is not in and of itself right. And if you, if you can can offer something, push back, tell, you know, give me a different perspective. Think of my idea as the springboard to get us started, Mm -hmm. not the end result where I'm trying to drag everyone to. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think being explicit a little bit about process is, is helpful. Uh, Being explicit about your own um, uh, uh, shortcomings, Mm -hmm. you know, to say, I, I, I'm usually pretty quick to the draw with a point of view that does not necessarily mean I'm I'm right. Um, um, so I, I think it's that combination of self-disclosure as well as uh, an explicit statement about process and the value associated with everybody's voices being in the mix. 
So final question, and then I'm going to let you go. If okay. you could kind of wave your magic wand and give us all more uh, aptitude around something or more energy around something, like what's the thing that you feel like we're not doing enough of um, or not doing at all that you would love to see all of us doing more as it relates to speaking up or creating the environment to speak up? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's uh, I've become super interested in the past, uh, year, I'm sure it's it's pandemic related somewhat uh, to the topic of empathy and the power uh, uh, of empathy, um, and it plays out all the time, every day, in every way uh, imaginable. Uh, for those of you hearing this message, if you're not familiar with the work of Jamil uh, Zaki out at Stanford, just such a tremendous person, and his research is really compelling as well too. Um, but empathy, the ability to try and imagine yourself in the shoes of someone else, you, you know, and I've particularly found myself doing that um, in, in these days and times in race relations as well, too. Mm-hmm. Here in the in, in the U.S. in particular, we have our own unique set of, of circumstances, but trying to actively make myself slow down and think about what it must feel like to be in a particular set of circumstances and, and, and to be pretty specific about those circumstances mm-hmm. and, and to ask yourself, how might it feel to be that person? Well, I think the same thing happens even in uh, speaking up. You know, what does it feel like to be that introverted person who someone may want to hear more from, but it's not the most comfortable thing in the world? What does that feel like to that mm-hmm. person? Or what does it feel like to be the only voice in the room where nine other people seem to be in alignment and you're the one who isn't, right. be that you or the, you know, or, or the other person, but to slow down long enough to think about what it might feel like to be that other person, to have empathy for them can dramatically change and improve, yeah. you know, the way you interact um, with others. So um, uh, you know, a little less rush to judgment and a little more slow down and imagining from a from an empathetic standpoint what it's like to be in the other person's situation. I love it. All right, I'm on board. Mary, as always, <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you for your time. You're thank you for your insights. I always learn a ton from our conversations and I'm just glad that some other people got to listen into this one. Um, and I look forward to all of the other ones that we'll have where no one else gets to listen in, just you and me. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. It's good to spend time with you. Good to spend time with you too, Mary. I'll talk to you soon. Our courage when you see it. Anytime someone you lead brings their voice to the table, especially if they're offering feedback about you, no matter how defensive you feel inside, celebrate their courage with gratitude and praise. When people offer unconventional ideas, challenge the views of colleagues during discussions, or raise concerns about behaviors that contradict what you've committed to, acknowledge their courage and hold them up as an example. Whose courage have you admired but failed to acknowledge? Who has offered out-of-the-box ideas or raised difficult issues within the past few weeks that you could go back and thank, apologizing for being remiss for not saying it sooner? Who has inspired you to be more courageous yourself. Think about it. Till next time, keep leaning into your moments of truth so that you can be the example of what it means to be honest.